All right, welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started while everybody starts to come on in. Uh, my name is Brian Tware. For anybody that doesn't know me or hasn't met me yet, I'm the interim coordinator for the Oscope 2 Chemistry Network. And we're excited to get our webinar series going again. It's been a while. Uh, so before we introduce uh, the uh, webinar today, uh, I'd like to give a quick update of the AGN since it's been quite a while for all of us. Go to the next slide, please. Cool. Uh, so just some quick highlights from the, the last year because it's been almost, uh, almost a year since we've had a webinar and there's been a lot going on. Uh, so we've had a Museums Victoria collaboration and what's been really great about this is not only are we bringing in uh, some of their uh, rock and mineral catalog into the Ajitokin platform, but we've worked with an open REST API. So they've been able to uh, create an API to match and uh, talk with ours. So whenever they update their collection, it'll update directly into Ajitokin, which is a pretty great, I think, step forward with moving towards that interoperability. Uh, at the start of 2022, we had a publication uh, by Sam Boone about the AjGeoChem platform. So please check that out if you have uh, some more in-depth questions about the, the platform. Uh, Mid-year, uh, the, the borders have opened. Some of us went to the Goldschmidt workshop and presented a uh, the AjGeoChem platform tutorial. Uh, along with uh, collaborating with uh, Earthkin, GeoRock, and, uh, uh, and uh, a few other platforms, uh, overall the One Geochemistry Initiative to look at fair data management practices. Uh, and that was great success and really the first, uh, I guess, presentation of the Ice Geochem platform uh, in person to the world. Uh, and in uh, Melbourne, uh, we finally were able to have an AGN workshop. So many of us have been working together for the last few years and only seen each other virtually. So it was pretty great to all get in a room together and, and uh, discuss what's been and, and plans forward and, and ideas and aspirations of the uh, Scope Geochemistry Network. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, another big highlight coming up is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, another big highlight coming up is uh, the Kamika 1300 being installed at Curtin University, which Osco um, had a big play in. And uh, that actually is launching later this week. So it's up and running, it's been tested being tested for the last few months. Uh, so some pretty exciting things to come uh, out of that lab. All right, next slide. So I don't take too much time. And uh, another really big, uh, I guess, uh, change and accomplishment for the Oscope Geochemistry Network is we onboarded an additional seven institutions to our AGN team. Uh, so that's been happening over the last few months and kind of culminated at that workshop in Melbourne that I was just, just uh, talking about. Uh, so we're excited for the way forward with a much bigger team and have a lot of great ideas. Uh, and part of that is, of course, continuing development on the Oz Geochem platform. So I've given you a little teaser of uh, some stuff that's on the horizon with the Ajgeochem and, and those images at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but I'll save most of it for the next webinar, webinar number, sorry, 11, uh, coming up later this year uh, in about six weeks time, we'll send out more information to come. But I'll save most of the reveals for then, uh, but we'll have a new release coming out late October and quite a few new data models being released or on the horizon to be released in the coming uh, few months. So please join us for that. All right, next slide. And I'll hand it over to Florian to introduce the webinar. 
All right, thanks, Brian. Um, so I'm happy to introduce um, Professor Anthony Tassetto from the University of Wollongong uh, and Wiggle, the Wollongong Isotope Geochemistry Laboratory. Um, uh, Tony is a man of many talents, uh, enjoys geochemistry, chronology, and its applications. Um, uh, he came uh, to Australia first in 2004 uh, and worked at Macquarie Uni as a postdoc and then later in 2009 moved to Wollongong University and since then has acquired many ARC discoveries and future fellowships and things um, and we're very uh, looking forward to hearing about uh, an isotopic wonder and metal isotope geochemistry from him. I guess this is the part where I share my screen. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, Florian, Hayden, for, for the invitation, and Sam, and, and the whole Oscope uh, community. I, I see Geo uh, was slided in the title in, in, the, in the slide you were showing. It's... I was actually thinking to talk about isotope chemistry in a, in a general sense, because uh, it's not really just geo, or I would have to put biogeochemistry, because a lot of the stuff actually uh, we're going to see today are uh, also attached to, to biology. Uh, and I guess the goal of this, uh, this seminar was to uh, showcase a little bit what the tools are generally used in the earth sciences uh, and especially in Australia with a focus on high temperature uh, earth sciences uh, and application to the mining and the resource industry, those tools uh, can be applied to a whole range of research question and that goes yes from the traditional geology but also to paleontology, archaeology, uh, and even med environmental science and even medical uh, sciences. So of course I don't do that by myself and uh, and actually uh, Florian is the only reason why uh, <laughs> we get uh, we got data well and the students uh, but he's, he's keeping uh, the whole lab running on his shoulders so kudos to him for that uh, and also a whole bunch of, of PhD students who uh, who conduct and, and drive all these uh, all these projects? So yes, yeah, so we're going to cover um, we're going to cover a whole range of things. So buckle up; uh, it's going to be a long journey. Hope you don't have any plans for dinner. Um, but we we're going to go from well, how did complex life emerge, and how can we try to understand the environmental changes that could be associated to the emergence of complex life, to what was on the menu of the now extinct Australian megafauna, uh, landscape response to climate variability in its global climate change week this week. So that's of course of relevance. Also developing tools to understand fire regimes, which in the context, in the Australian co context, that's obviously very important. And also even uh, using, again, those tools from the geoscience community to even develop diagnostic tools for, for, for chronic disease like chronic kidney disease. And, and to do this, we're going to be exploring uh, the periodic table. So that's why I have the periodic table with this different drawings. So uh, I don't think Megafauna was eating spaghetti uh, for dinner, but uh, we'll, we'll have a look about that. So let's start very lightly. Uh, we've just lived the universe and everything, right? Uh, but focusing maybe not so much on the universe, but just on our planet. Well, one of the things personally I'm interested in is uh, to understand uh, when and why life started to get complex. So why did we start getting animals and when? Because if you look at the evolution of life on our planet, for most actually, and, and life has been kicking around for almost as long as we've had a planet, um, but for most 
of the Earth's history, life was actually pretty basic. Uh, single cellular, and even when it got multicellular, that was still fairly basic. It's only recently, in geological terms, uh, maybe you know, not more than a billion years ago, uh, that that life started getting complex. And by complex, I mean when you start having tissue differentiation, when you start making a vascular system, uh, a skeletal system, and all that uh, 3D organization, why, how you have, you know, this sort of symmetry uh, in our body and so on. Uh, and also when you look uh, at, at paleontological study, you see that there's a bit of a takeoff in biodiversity at about 150 million years ago. So during this period of time, about between a billion and between and, and 600 million years ago, something is happening that's really kick-starting complex life on our planet. And during that period of time, something environmentally, something really interesting is happening. We have these episodes called uh, Snowball Earth, and that's uh, long-term glaciation, widespread glaciation, where the entire planet uh, was covered in ice and would have looked like something like a scene from Empire Strikes Back. Uh, so it's really interesting to study then what could have happened when that planet, that icy planet thawed and how that could have delivered large amount of nutrient to the ocean and maybe give that boost to the evolution of life. So to study that, that to study that link between those widespread glaciation and change in ocean chemistry, because that's where that's where the key is in understanding evolution, uh, we can turn to carbonate rocks. Carbonate rocks are archive or ancient seawater composition. Here you get a picture of uh, the Adiacaran in the Flinders Range. So that's where uh, the the uh, the stratotype is defined and here, being a mama's boy, uh, here's a picture with my mom. She's a big fan of the Ediacaran biota. And these rocks are really useful because that's where, especially in the Flanders Range, uh, where that's where you have the first evidence of animal fossils. And well, you really have to look for them uh, in the Ediacaran. They're really, they're really rare. Uh, but then you get into the Cambrian, and of course, you have that Cambrian explosion. And uh, when I was there with, with students, I showed them those rocks from the Cambrian. And suddenly in the, in the rock record, you have hundreds and hundreds of, of fossils. So I was telling them to get excited. And you can see there the awe on their face of excitement looking at all these fossils. Uh, so to understand the change in ocean chemistry back then, so looking at these carbonate rocks, we turned to lithium ice top. Lithium ice top tell us about silicate weathering, tell us about uh, chemical weathering, making up of soil on continent, what is going on, and it's gonna be many interesting aspects of that, but what is going on in terms of weathering those continent and delivering nutrient to the oceans. So if we look at rocks, okay, maybe not that rock, uh, but this type of rock, uh, the lithium isotop composition of rock is fairly narrow and it doesn't really depend that much on the type of rock type. That's going to be interesting to understand how we can use uh, that tool. Because then, so you have lithium six, lithium seven in rocks. And when those rocks weather and form soil, so lithium six will prefer to stay in new, new, new form minerals like clays, well, lithium seven is gonna be growing preferentially in solution and in rivers. So as a result, that lithium isotope composition, so the lithium isotope composition of river water, for instance, is gonna be a function of the weathering regime. So whether you have weathering incongruent dissolutions, so not much weathering happening, but fast weathering in mountains, or really extensive weathering in tropical plains. And that's going to help us inform about what is delivered from the continent to the ocean back then, looking at these carbonate rocks. So the source stuff we see, so in blue, that's 
from a section of cap carbonates from uh, the Flinders range. And in red, that's about the same age, but from China. What all these data tell us, well, we can use what we measure in the rocks that's on the left to then translate that into the lithium isotope composition of the seawater back then. And what we find is that 600 million years ago, the, the ocean probably did, not, did have a lithium isotope composition that wasn't that different from the modern ocean. So in terms of chemistry of the ocean, could have been fairly similar to what we have today. That I find, when we found that, I found that a little bit mind blowing. Uh, so that means that to get an ocean chemistry that's similar to what it is today, that means what was delivered to the ocean was also similar. So what was going on on the continents back then, we could have seen similar landscape, similar diversity of landscape to what we see today. So very fast weathering and incomplete weathering in uh, mountain ranges, but also really deep, deeply weather, thick and deeply weathered soil in tropical region. That is really, uh, again, mind blowing because we don't have any land plants. Land, the emergence of land plants 100 million years later were critical to really uh, boost chemical weathering on continents, but we don't have that yet. And yet what we see in the ocean is that maybe this diversity of landscape already existed. So yeah, I get easily mind blown. Uh, so then we can take that a step further and use a box model. So just looking at the inventory of lithium in different compartments and the flux uh, that goes into the ocean and out of the ocean to try to get an idea of the flux of lithium that we get from the continent to the ocean. And what we find to try to reproduce uh, these data, so in blue and in red, is that we could have had different stage uh, of, of nutrient delivery. So to get to reproduce uh, these data, we need very large flux of lithium to the ocean. And large flux of lithium that are sustained for a very long time, several million years, much longer than what uh, some people have previously previously suggested. And these changes, these different stages I got here on the right, they seem to happen on timescale that's similar to Milankovitch timescale, stuff that we're familiar with in the quaternary in the recent couple million years, but really we don't get much of an idea of what's going on 600 million years ago. We see that this change could have followed Milankovitch cycles so that switch between glacial and interglacial period could be what sustained large flux of lithium and other nutrients to the ocean. So really to take the important take home message from this is sustain nutrient flux, high nutrient flux for several million years. So why is that? Well, if we turn to, uh, to um, evolutionary biology, well, this, this paper uh, that I'm citing at the top here, they look at body size measurement from fossil records, but also from recent records. And what they see is that in a nutshell is that you can have a short time scale change in evolution, but they're not going to accumulate. So when you have rapid shift in the condition of biological system, you're not going to have major shift in evolution. What they found is that it's really when those change apply to ecosystem goes on for longer than a million year, that's when you have major shift in evolution. And what's interesting is from that work, we see that, well, we have a sustained large nutrient flux to the ocean for several million years. Again, possibly driven by Milankovitch st st style climate variability. So the question is, is the key to those big evolution leaps 
is the key to the emergence of complex life that sustain mass nutrient delivery that we see for several million years uh, at the end of the merino and glaciation. So yeah, again, mind blown. All right, so that's for the emergence of complex life. Now let's go to a much more recent time scale. Looking at in, in Australia, we had very large marsupials, very large reptiles. Well, they all kick the bucket now. Well, we still have you know fairly large kangaroos, but nothing like what we had up to a few tens of thousands of years ago. And there's a lot of discussion about how all these animals disappeared, but to understand that, we really need to understand how they lived before they were extinct. And that's the sort of stuff we're working on here. There's a lot of stuff you can learn from teeth, uh, not just as a dentist, but also uh, in our disciplines, teeth and especially fossil teeth can tell us a lot of things about the past. That's paper we published a couple of years ago, where we looked a change in trace element and change in strontium high stop in fossil teeth. And we found that uh, these ancient uh, hominins, so our, our ancestors, were uh, uh, probably shifting a lot between feeding their children with uh, the mother's milk and accessing other resources, so external sources of milk. Uh, and, and using strontium stuff, we found that that's probably because they didn't travel too much in the landscape. So depending on the stress they experienced to accessing resource, sometimes they had to go back to breastfeeding. And you can apply this sort uh, of technique. So you can use fossil teeth to do all sorts of things. So for instance, here we've been working on fossil teeth of uh, extinct Australian megafauna marsupials and also extant uh, marsupials. And you can do a sort of thing on the tooth using uranium thorium ice stop. You can date directly the tooth, so get an age of that animal. Using strontium ice stop, you can look at what we call the home range. So, how far did the animal travel to get their food, which is really important to understand their resilience to. Uh, to change the environment to human presence, so their potential to extinction, uh, and also calcium I stop to look at what they were eating, were they for herbivores, were they browsers or, or grazers, and for carnivores, what, what type of herbivore were they eating. So reconstruct what we call a trophic structure of the ecosystem. So strong semi stuff, I thought I'd talk about that study uh, recently. Uh, these people look at uh, the tusk of woolly mammoth, and that tusk grows continuously during the mammoth life. And they were using, they used strong semi stuff as a sort of paleo GPS. So they could, all these wiggles you hear, you see here in the bottom right, they could use that to track, to paleo track, where that mammoth has been in the landscape. So here we're looking at Alaska uh, and how that mammal traveled throughout its life, um, throughout that Alaskan landscape. And also, but to do this, you need maps. So you need to, to you know, a, a GPS is only as useful to take you somewhere and take you somewhere you need a map for that. In that case, it's no different. You need what we call strong surmise escapes. Uh, so you need maps of how is your strong surmise stuff ratio vary in the landscape. So when you measure that in a fossil tooth, you can get, you can connect that to your map and get some idea uh, of where that animal has been traveling to. So that's something that's been done here on the left. I'm showing some paper uh, where they've done a strong surmise escape of Cape York Peninsula in the northeastern part of Australia. And then once you have these sort of maps, you can use numerical model, that's what I'm showing here on the right, to um, really reconstruct what should be that strong semi stop landscape. So you see in, in that figure on the right, the whole world is covered, but the resolution is really variable depending on the region you look at. Yes, you get some 
some data, some assumptions just based on rock type for Australia, uh, but there's a lot of gap to fill to test this assumption. And that's something at Oscope uh, we discuss about doing. So maybe extending some work Florian and I have done with Patrice de Carita, uh, Geoscience Australia, starting really mapping other parts of Australia. And we hope, of course, to, to extend that work. And using calcium isotope, well, calcium isotope in fossil teeth has been used, for instance, in uh, uh, ancient hominins and showing uh, the diversity in diets of different species of ancient hominin. You see for Paranthropus, it's something really strange compared to other uh, species of hominin. Uh, and early Homo sapiens maybe have a much more uh, diverse diet than other type of ancient hominins, maybe telling us about uh, this resilience uh, to exploring the landscape to get their resource. But also doing that on teeth of different ages, that can tell you for how long different species of animal of humans were uh, breastfeeding, which is important to understand the reproductive, rep reproductive cycle of different species, which help you understand how they live and their resilience to environmental change. What that shows you here on the right is that these early Homo sapiens, they were having their kids for much longer uh, on uh, the mother's milk than other hominins, which means these other hominins, uh, like Australopithecus africanus, Paranthropus robustus, they were cutting off uh, their kids much quicker uh, than early Homo sapiens. Then we can apply that to other animals than humans and really look at a whole range. So that's something that's been done uh, in Kenya. And you see here on the x-axis, different species. So you got your hyena, your hippo, uh, big cats, pigs, and so on. Uh, and applying calcium isotop in teeth of these different uh, taxa that can tell you who's eating what and who's eating who. Uh, so especially useful, for instance, if you look at carnivores, so once you get a picture of the modern fauna, you can then explore the fossils and get some idea of uh, what has changed between your fossil taxa and, uh, and the modern fauna. And you can explore things like, for instance, if I look at the big cats here, uh, the different type of herbivores this big cat were eating. These values up here, these higher values, probably tell you that this group of big cats, of lions and so on, might have been feeding on browser herbivores, so maybe like giraffe and so on. Uh, whereas these lower value are telling you that uh, these lions might have been feeding on grazers preferentially. But especially interesting to apply that when you have no idea or very little idea of what now extinct animal like the Australian megafauna system uh, we're eating. So that's something in Wollongong we've been working uh, with a whole range of people looking at different sites around Australia. We had a uh, piece in the conversation a few years ago uh, looking at South Walker Creek in Queensland. Uh, that was that piece had, I can't remember, tens of thousands of read, uh, but I think, you know, we were right in the middle of the first COVID lockdown and people were just sick to hear about COVID. They wanted to read something about giant kangaroo, but still that was great to see that uh, there was a lot of interest in the public uh, to, to read about Australian megafauna. Uh, and that's the work of, uh, so one of the PhD students here now at, at James Cook University and also part of the of our scope is Daphne, Daphne Kutamaris. So she looked at different things. She looked at strontium and calcium isotop uh, in different fossil taxa. So from Wellington Caves in Bingara, so two sites in New South Wales. Wellington Caves is partly uh, uh, popular in the paleontology community because that's the oldest site where we found, uh, the first site where people found megafauna fossils. 
It's a bit of an icon in uh, in the megafauna uh, paleontology. Uh, and she looked at transformized stuff, so in, in teeth of Protemnodon, so that giant wallaby, uh, that giant cousin of the wombat, the diprotodon, and also procoptodon, and also compared that to fossil extent uh, taxa, so like rock wallaby or the rat kangaroo. And what we found is that there was similar short range value uh, between the different taxa. So these big marsupials weren't traveling much further than those smaller marsupials that were living there at the same time. So that really maybe the body size didn't have that much of a role in determining how far those species travel. And it's more the climate and the environment that would determine how far uh, the animals travel which is again really important to understand the resilience to environmental change. And then Chris so just actually submitted his honor thesis last week. So Chris had worked on Mount Etna uh, caves in, uh, in Queensland, which is a really interesting site because it's pretty much the only paleontology site of megafauna we have in Australia that is a rainforest ecosystem. Most of the other sites are, are already dry uh, environment. And there Chris look at Protemnodon and again compare that to smaller extant marsupial uh, like the tree kangaroo. And here too, we find the same sort of story but not much difference between these two, these two type of marsupials. Again, indicating that uh, the very large marsupial like the Protemnodon probably didn't travel too far to get their food. Could be also in that rainforest environment is that uh, the resources were always available to any type of marsupials. So they didn't have to, even if they could, they didn't have to travel far to get their food. And then looking at calcium I stop uh, in, uh, in those fossils from Wellington case in Bingara, so Daphne found something really interesting that the diet, well, first, that the diet of the fossil extant marsupials, so those who are still around, is consistent with what we know of their modern equivalent, which is good because calcium ice top uh, is still a new technique applied to diet and trophic structure reconstruction. So that was good to verify that the data we get on extant marsupials, like the rock wallaby or like the eastern gray kangaroo, actually makes sense. Then when we apply that to species where we don't know much about their diet, we found that the procoptodon and the protemnodon, so these large marsupials, probably had a fairly specialized diet. So maybe then we can start thinking about uh, their exposure to extinction. If they have a very specialized diet, that means they're very vulnerable if the environment changes and they can't find a food versus another type of animal, which would have a bit more of a diverse diet. Another interesting uh, result from, uh, from Daphne's work, so she also studied modern uh, wombats and by comparing that to the diprotodon, she found that actually the diet probably wasn't that different. So again, despite very different body size, not much of a difference in diet between these two different species. All right, so now we're gonna turn into, and that being you know, Global Climate Change Science Week, uh, we're gonna be talking about how the environment adapt to climate variability. So looking at trees, because they're gonna play a big role, erosion, and we're gonna throw Alexander the Great into the mix, because why not? So the interesting question here is to understand how do we go from, for instance, that type of environment to this type? How does our environment, how do our water resources, soil resource respond to climate variability. And of course, for that, we can turn, uh, we can turn to the past to understand uh, these relationships. 
It's particularly important because the loss of soil uh, has been linked to the fall, to the demise of many past uh, civilization. Not as the only reason, but as a contributing factor to the demise of past civilization. So of course, if we don't want to end up like these guys, we want to be preserving our soil. And for that, we need to understand how soil loss, how soil erosion is linked to climate variability. So again, we turn to a lithium ice top, and this time apply in sediment deposit. So we're not doing that in rocks anymore, but much shorter time scale. We look at sediment deposit in lakes, in oceans, and so on. And the lithium ice top composition of sediment is telling us about the extent of soil development. So lower delta seven lithium in the sediment is telling us there's more clay formation. So there's more soil development, a more stable landscape, because you have time for the soil to, to develop on your hill slopes. And also we can use uranium ice top, because uranium ice top in uh, soils will decrease as you go towards the surface of your soil. So then when you measure that in sediment, that can tell you something about the different type of erosion. If you have a lower uranium ice top ratio in your river sediment, that can tell you that you have fairly shallow erosion on your soils in your catchment, and a higher ratio can tell, her, can tell you about deeper erosion. And we do so, this diagram at the top, it's purely schematic, but when we look at real data in soil profile, we do see this sort of relationship. So I'm not just pulling that out of my hat. I don't have a hat anyway. Um, so we applied that first, well, it's only been more than 10 years. I was still uh, at Macquarie back then when we did that. Uh, so we applied that first to uh, Paleo Channel, so all the abandoned channels of the Murrumbidgee River uh, in southeastern Australia. And what we found is change in, in sediment uh, residence time, so the amount of time that uh, the sediment is spending in the catchment, we found that that followed the pollen record. And that was really uh, the type of vegetation we had in the upper catchment that was driving how the sediment was moving through the river system. And during, for instance, the last glacial maximum, we found that this short residence time, so the sediment being flushed out of the, Mern, of the Murrumbidgee River uh, rapidly, was a response to thin soils in the upper catchment, because we had very sparse vegetation, very few trees. Whereas during interglacial, whether now or uh, during the marine ice top stage five, about 100,000 uh, years ago, you had a much slower sediment movement throughout the catchment. And that's because we interpret that because during these times you have a lot of trees in the upper catchment, so they're retaining that soil, so disconnecting the river in the lower part of the river, disconnecting the sediment from the upper catchment. Very little delivery of sediment from the upper part of the catchment in the snow is, uh, into the main channel. And what you find in the main Murrumbidgee channel is mostly reworking of sediment from the alluvial plains, so from the riverina, that are just being re-entrained into uh, the Murrumbidgee River. And then I was also applied, so that was the work of two PhD students, Leo and Davide, uh, and Alex Franke as a postdoc was now in Adelaide and working with URI uh, and others down there. Uh, so we applied that to uh, Lake, uh, so Lake Dorian here in uh, at the border of Greece and uh, the Republic of Northern Macedonia. Uh, so looking at a Holocene record, so we're looking at the last 12,000 years. And you have here in red your uranium ice top record, and in black your lithium ice top record. Found something really interesting. So that uranium ice top record, these up and downs, are showing us that 
soil erosion is really following very tightly any type of of climate of climatic changes. So even very short colder periods, just a few hundred years uh, at 8,000 and 4,000 years ago, that's slowing down soil erosion. So really tight coupling between climate and erosion. For soil formation that we get from lithium ice stuff, it's much different. Basically what that curve is showing us is that as soon as the end of the last glacial is over, so these prevailing cold condition are over, we start making soil. And even when there's a cold snap at 8,000 years ago, soil formation doesn't care, it just carries on. And then after 4,000 years, that's where we bring in Alexander the Great, something really interesting happens. Both ice stop proxies are telling us there's really deep erosion going on, the deepest that's been seen in the last 12,000 years. And then working with the archaeologist, we, uh, we came to the conclusion that I was best explained by what is possibly the earliest environmental catastrophe driven by human activity. So trees, timber in Macedonia was very, uh, in very high demand in, uh, in ancient Greece to make ships and other things. That was a time of war too. So what could have happened is following deforestation, that intense deforestation of that region of Greece could have driven the massive soil erosion event that we see in the sediment record from uranium and lithium ice top. And that's also associated, that's actually in the archaeological record, that's, associated, that's the onset of what people call the Dark Ages in, uh, in Greek history. So maybe there were other environmental catastrophes in other parts of, of ancient Greece that could have driven uh, a paucity, a uh, depletion in soil and uh, soil resources. That's where you get your food from, uh, which could have contributed to those dark ages in Greek history. And then probably skip on that one because I can see that we're almost at uh, five o'clock. Uh, but that's some, some work we've done in Germany in, uh, in an other sediment, uh, sediment record where we, we see a much different history, probably doing with, dealing with the fact that the Germans uh, were probably much more careful back then with their trees than the Greek were. Uh, and then another work, so a nearby lake, so the border between Greece and Albania, so Lake Ohed. So work Alex did also uh, a couple of years ago. We see also a very interesting association between trees, erosion, and climate variability. And what you're supposed to see on this diagram is as follows. For the first part of the record, so on the right side of the diagram, for the first few thousand years, we see a fairly tight coupling between climate variability and erosion. In a nutshell, when it's cold, there's less erosion. Erosion slows down. A little bit like a chemical reaction, except that it's not, but you slow down erosion as it's getting colder. And then at about eight and a half thousand years ago, something really interesting happened. We don't see that coupling anymore. Erosion is just slow. Even, even it, that it's warm, and we should have fast erosion, well, we just don't record that in the sediment record from uranium ice stuff. Erosion just slows down. And when you look at the pollen record, it's telling you that there's a big shift happening at eight and a half thousand years ago. That's a time where after this, there's a real widespread dominance of trees in the landscape. Your whole catchment, is much more thoroughly covered with trees. So what might happen once we reach that threshold of tree cover in the landscape, that could have disconnected soil erosion from climate variability. Suddenly, trees have changed the relationship with 
climate and soil erosion. And that's really important to understand our resilience of soil resources to climate variability. Trees, the type of vegetation, are playing a key role here in the middle. So yeah, thumbs up from Chuck Norris and well done, bro. Well done, Alex, uh, for that work. And we're also uh, developing new proxies, so something in environmental science that's of course of, of critical importance in Australia, are understanding bushfires. We want to understand in the future, with future climate change, how are what we call fire regimes, so the characteristic of bushfires, change, how will they change that? And again, you can turn to the past to understand past relationship with change in fire regime and climate variability. So at the moment, so that's the topic of a discovery uh, project we have at the moment. So that was good to get a bit of money to do that research because a lot of these research projects we do, they actually, you know, trying to put together a couple of dollars to get them going. So we actually have a discovery grant that's, that's looking at developing these new tools. So one of them is to look at bone ice top. The reason why we turn to bone is because that's an element that's heavily cycled through vegetation. So the hypothesis with this project is that if we do something to vegetation, for instance, burn it to the ground, like you have in a high severity fire, that should change the way bone is cycled. There's nothing to cycle it into, which could then change the ice to be composition of the soil. And Sean here was doing his PhD uh, did some experiment that shows that indeed the bone ice top composition of clay change depending on the temperature of the fire. So what he did was basically burn a piece of wood at different temperature, leach that with water, reproducing what the rainwater would do to ash, and that rainwater interacts with clay, and we see that even at the short time scale of a lab experiment, they are changed the bone ice top composition of the clay. And what is cool is that also when we looked at soil that have experienced different fire history, so LL shows you a soil that experienced two low severity fires, so fires that don't go really high on the tree. HH is a soil site that experience too high severity fire. So fires that go all the way to the canopy. So they burn the entire tree. And he sees that indeed for those sites, those soils that experience really high severity fire, you do see an increase in bone ice top composition in the clay minerals of this soil. So maybe we have a tool looking at clay uh, and their bone ice top composition. Maybe we have a tool to investigate the severity, the characteristic of a bushfire. Because then, and that's the work Rebecca is doing in her PhD, uh, then we can start thinking, applying that to sediment records to go in the past. So maybe a high brown ice top composition of the clays in the sediment records could tell us about ancient high severity fires and then correlate that uh, to, to climate uh, records. And that's some things, so some of the results she got from Bargo, so just in between Wollongong and Sydney, where I experienced really high severity fire uh, just 10 years ago. Uh, she found when she looked at a sediment record, she does find positive excursion, not always, so it's not a perfect tool, but she does find positive excursion, so higher bone ice top composition in the sediment associated to known fires. So that's cool. So we can calibrate that to known recent fires. And the next thing we will do, bringing in other proxy like uranium ice top to look at uh, soil erosion, to go back in time and be able to really identify a different type of fires. So that's really exciting because suddenly uh, we can access change in fire regime, link that to climate records, to link, link that what is changing in the climate that causes a change in fire regime. And also important understanding how these fires drive soil erosion 
which drive change in water quality, which re is really important also, not just the fire, but also the water quality for our communities. Hopefully I got a couple minutes to finish up with disease. Uh, so no one's cutting me off yet. So I'll, I'll take that as an approval. So yeah, so just to finish off and really uh, uh, something that is gonna sound really far field from geology, but again, using just those same tool that we apply in rocks, we can apply that, well, to ourselves, uh, our blood, to understand the development and maybe also even diagnose uh, things like chronic diseases. So I'm gonna take the example of chronic kidney disease and chronic kidney disease is actually really important. I wasn't aware before I started working on this, uh, I didn't even know that was such an important disease. 10% of the population globally, 10% of the population in Australia is affected by chronic kidney disease. That means that unfortunately, in the audience here today, I think we got about 40 people, is at least four people uh, who are likely to be affected by chronic kidney disease. In the Wollongong region, it's worse than that. It's 20% of the population. In Australia, with indigenous communities, it's also about 20% of indigenous communities that are affected by chronic kidney disease. So really an important condition uh, to address in our communities. One thing that is key with kidney disease, it's actually, it's not so much, I mean, it is what's going on in the kidney, but it's more about what's going on in your blood vessels. It's the vascular calcification. So the formation of a deposit in your blood vessel. And that, of course, that's gonna create cardiovascular problems. So, and that's one of the main issue with kidney disease. People actually die of a heart attack they die of cardiovascular disease before they die from their kidney failure. Um, so one thing you want to understand then is to be able to diagnose this vascular calcification so you can help patient with kidney disease. The problem in diagnosing vascular calcification is that you can use CT scans, but for that to show up on a CT scan is gonna to be too late. It's gonna be way too widespread by the time you're able to see that. There are other techniques to detect vascular calcification. They involve this kind of instrument, instrument, but for that, you have to go to an hospital, you have to go to specialized unit. So that's not routinely done. And actually for people who have chronic kidney disease, it's actually not recommended uh, to do any sort of screening because the tools are just not adapted to catch that early. And it's very unlikely that's going to help uh, the health condition of the patient. So it's just adding burden. It's just generally not recommended to do that. So it would be really useful to have a tool, like just being able to do that on a urine or a blood sample to be able to diagnose vascular calcification. So now we turn back. We use calcium stop in fossil teeth to tell about the diet of megafauna. Well, we can use that in blood and urine to tell us about chronic disease. That's something, calcium isotope in urine and blood, that's something that's been developed as a biomarker to change in your bone mineral balance, whether you're losing or gaining a bone. And it's been applied, and in Germany, they actually developed a startup company to use calcium isotope in urine and blood to uh, diagnose osteoporosis. So in the study we've done here, we're working with the local hospital in Wollongong, we select a set of controls, people who don't have chronic kidney disease and people who have different stage of the disease and also transplant, people who receive, who have the disease but receive a kidney transplant. What we find in urine, well, first I'll show you what doesn't work. So that doesn't always work. In urine, we don't really see differences in the different groups. So. The calcium isotope composition of urine is not really helping us either diagnose kidney disease itself or uh, vascular calcification. What we find is just calcium concentration is actually telling us something about the progression of kidney disease. 
I'm going a little bit faster because I see that we, we're we running out of time. So that's why I'm like, oh, he's showing all that stuff, we, but we, he's not explaining. So sorry. Um, then calcium is stopped in serum. So in blood serum, in, your, in blood sample, we do see an association with the presence of the disease. People who have advanced stage of kidney disease, they have a higher calcium isotop composition in their blood than those who don't have disease or who have a mild version of the disease. And that's working quite well as a diagnostic tool. But maybe I'll explain that when we look at calcification. So then looking, trying to see if we can use that to detect vascular calcification, the different type of calcification. For one of them, it's not working at all. It's not sensitive to detect intimal calcification. What it's doing quite well, it's associated to pulse wave velocity. So that's the technique that we use at the moment uh, to detect medial calcification, which is the type of vascular calcification that dominate in CKD patient. So that's the one anyway we're really concerned with, and it's it's working quite well. So then I can, I can explain here what we see. So that A you see, that means area under the curve. When you do diagnostic to analysis, you want that number to be as close to one as possible. You see 0 0.8, 0 0.8 tells me it's a good diagnostic tool. Not perfect, but, but it's good. Sensitivity is how able you are at detecting true positive. So people who have the disease. So 82%, that means it's doing a good job to pick, finding the population, those who have the disease. It's just like your COVID test. You know, your COVID test has sensitivity and specificity, which actually not going to be nearly as good as the numbers you see here. And specificity is your ability to identify true negative. So by not saying, oh yeah, this person have the disease, well, actually they don't. So high number means you, you're able to do that quite well. So what we find with these numbers is that just a blood sample and measuring calcium stuff in the blood sample is fairly good at telling us that a person has a form of vascular calcification, which could cause cardiovascular problem. So you can see that that could be developed as really easily accessible. You just need a blood sample and an accurate diagnostic tool to identify uh, vascular calcification in patients with kidney disease, where we can also start thinking about using that as a tool for anyone who has some sort of developing cardiovascular disease. So yeah, we're really happy with that. So Mr. Bean is really happy. All right, I should probably end there. Thanks for that. Thanks for great. still being here. <laughs> uh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. It's really cool. It's cool to see what uh, what we can do with the isotope systems outside of your your norm, or I guess most of our normal uh, uh, geology you know, um, peripheral view. All right. So I do know it's late. Uh, so I'll say thanks for everybody who's joined. Uh, if you need to run off, I'm happy to keep this open for a little bit. If there are any questions, I would like to be uh, directed to Anthony. Either fire it into the chat or just unmute yourself and ask. I have a question for Tony. Uh, it's Brent McKinnis here. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, Tony, Sorry. that was a fantastic presentation. Um, what's the current thinking uh, in terms of sampling uh, teeth? Um, for, a, for a one stage there, there was a, a bit of controversy about which part of the tooth that was, was preferred in paleoenvironmental studies. What's, what, where are things landed? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so you probably know, so generally you're going to be targeting enamel because uh, enamel is going to be your denser part of the tooth. So that's going to be the more resistant to diagenesis. Uh, and of course, in any study that we do, for instance, strontium can be prone in, to diagenesis. So that signal you're trying to look for 
uh, could be altered to what's happening to the tooth after uh, the animal died. Uh, so generally we're testing that, also measuring trace element and looking for those trace element, things like manganese, who shouldn't, wouldn't be in the tooth. If you find that in part of the tooth, you can probably reject the strontium isotope data for that part of the, of the tooth. But one of the, that's also one of the interests when we use calcium isotope to look at paleo diet, because you're dealing with calcium, which is the main element in the tooth, of course, uh, the calcium isotope ratio is much more resistant to diagenesis. That would take a truckload of calcium from the environment to modify the signal. Yeah, very cool, thanks. I see that, uh, can you raise a hand? Do you have a question? Sure, um, Tony, I don't know much about um, your techniques here. So this is a techniques question. Um, I'm just wondering when you, you're measuring these soils, of course, soils are full of all kinds of complex matter and isotopes like boron and uh, can adhere and be really problematic. So how do you prepare your samples for those analyses? Yeah, so generally we look at a restricted size fraction. Uh, for instance, stuff I was talking about for boron, we'd be focusing on the clay size fraction uh, because you're going to be, well, there's, there's an anal analytical advantage to that because one, your bone, I saw, your bone concentration in clay is super high. So you really need a small amount of material, but also this is where the isotope fractionation is happening. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. where the money is uh, in terms of your environmental signal. But yeah, that's a very good point. So, so when you say clay, you mean a grain size clay. You don't actually mean a clay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So okay. in that size fraction, you're going to have clay minerals, but not necessarily uh, just that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Any more questions? All right. Well, then I'll Good say talk. yeah. I'll say thanks. It was, it was thanks, Anthony. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it was really great. Really, really interesting stuff. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone.